begin a new sermon series today that I'm going to call The Battle with Unbelief. The Battle with Unbelief. And when I say the battle with unbelief, I'm not talking about that battle that's out there, the culture wars, uh, the unbelievers that are trying to suppress the truth of God. We know that's true. We know Romans 1 tells us that, that they're trying to suppress the truth of God, and that's for sure. They're trying to remove God from all the uh, aspects of our of our society. But I'm not talking about that battle when I say the battle with unbelief. Most of us know where the battle of unbelief rages. Amen? It rages in our mind, right? That's where the battlefield is. That's what I'm talking about. The Bible says that it's thoughts and ideas, imaginations and pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God that we've got to take captive uh, and that comes from one of my favorite verses, Second uh, Corinthians 10. Um, you've, you've seen this. It pops up in a lot of my sermons. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, the weapons, have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Arguments and pretensions our thoughts, their ideas, their imaginations. King James says imaginations. So where does that all happen? It all happens in our brain. The enemy brings thoughts to our mind. He doesn't have access to our heart if we're in Christ, but he can still bring thoughts, temptations, ideas, imaginations, pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God and we t- or to take those captive. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What's this fight that Paul's talking about here? It's fighting temptations, yes, but it's more than fighting temptations. It's deeper than that. Temptations are a part of it. But it's a battle of believing God, trusting God, believing and trusting His truth that, by the way, will set us free. Trusting what He has said, trusting His word about who He is and who we are and and everything else. That's the knowledge of God here at this verse. That's the truth, the knowledge of God. And these ideas, these imaginations are setting themselves up in opposition to that. What's the first piece of armor in the other famous spiritual warfare scripture that we all know from Ephesians 6? The armor of God. The first piece is the belt of truth. Okay, it's the belt of truth. Truth is truth. The enemy is a liar. He's a father of lies. There's no truth in him. So he lies and he sets himself up against that knowledge. This description of this battle that we're fighting, it's a battle of believing or not believing. The battle of unbelief. And unbelief here is is heeding the voice of the one who's setting himself in opposition to God. I asked Deanna to put a a key verse for this series on the front of the bulletin. It's Hebrews 3.12. And there the writer of Hebrews gives a warning. And it's a warning to Christians. See there he says, brothers and sisters, see to it. See to it means that this is our responsibility. This is our job. This is something that God has given to us and he's empowered us with his Holy Spirit to do it, brothers and sisters, the church, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. That's a lot of stuff there in that last phrase. He ties sinfulness and unbelieving heart together and he says our unbelieving heart will actually turn away from God. But what's kind of amazing is that he's he's addressing this to Christians. Now, we all know that as Christians, we're believers. You can't be a Christian without being a believer. It's, it's the definition of what a Christian is. That's how you got to be a Christian. You believed, right? We've got lots and lots of scripture of that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that everybody in the world would be saved, no questions. No, that whosoever believeth shall have everlasting. That's, that's how you get in the family. In John chapter 6, Jesus said to uh, somebody who came and asked him a question. They said, what are the works that we must do? There it is. What, 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 what must, excuse me, what must we do to do the work that God requires? And there's a whole lot of people in this world that are asking that question. How good do I have to be? I was at a theme park once, uh, and I saw a teenager walking around with a t-shirt, and I, I don't know how in the world he was bold enough to wear this shirt, but he was, and it said, <coughs> How much sin can I do and still get to heaven? And you know, he was bold enough to wear it on his t-shirt, but that's kind of the attitude of a lot of the world. 
How much sin can, what, what must we do? What's the work that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe. That's how you get to be a Christian. You believe God. You, that was our Sunday school lesson. We put our faith in God and we, when we put our faith in, we receive. So to be a Christian, you've got to be a believer. It's by grace you're saved through faith. But here in, in Hebrews, back one up, back up one there, Amanda. He, he addresses this to believers, to Christians. He says, see to it that you don't have an unbelieving heart. So why would he give this very serious warning to watch out for an unbelieving heart to believers? Well, apparently it's possible for believers to begin to have an unbelieving heart. Or there's places where we don't quite believe God. To allow our hearts to wander into unbelief to the extent that, according to this, when we do that, it can actually turn us away from God. I want to tell you, that's a, that's a pretty dire warning. That's, that's, a, that's a hard thing to think, even think about. Now, the context here is it's in the book of Hebrews. So it's written to Hebrew Christians. Jews, Jewish people that had come to faith in Christ and they were under persecution. They were under persecution both from the Romans and the Jews, just like Jesus was. And it was hard persecution. And so what they were contemplating, as you read the book of Hebrews, it's a, it's an argument really to these Jewish Christians to not think that they can return to the old covenant of the law. Because that's what, that's what was going on. They were thinking, well, we'll just go back to, to what we already knew. We'll go back to the law. We'll go back to keeping the law and making animal sacrifices and relying on the priest to make atonement. We'll just go back to that and we'll, we'll free ourselves from some of this persecution because it's just too hard. By the way, that was the lie that was being spoken to their brains. It's too hard. Just quit. Just give up. Anybody ever hear that lie? That's one of the devil's favorites. It's too hard. Quit. Give up. It wasn't going to be very long, just a few years um, after Hebrews was written. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, which brought an end to all animal sacrifices, which brought an end to the temple worship. So God himself put put an exclamation point to this period. You can't go back to that covenant. Now that his covenant with Abraham still stands, amen? That's an everlasting covenant. But, but the covenant with Moses, the covenant of the law, the covenant of Mount Sinai has been replaced with the covenant of grace because the law was fulfilled. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. And that's the covenant that we're under. And because of that covenant, we're grafted into the first one. We become children of Abraham. I'm going to be careful. I'll get on preaching a different sermon here. So for them, having an unbelieving heart, that turned them away from God was an unbelieving heart that turned away from faith in Christ and we'll just, we'll just turn back to Judaism. We'll just turn back to the sacrifices. We'll just turn back to the law. What does it mean for us when, when we get this warning? Be careful. Watch out that you don't have an unbelieving heart. What does that mean for us? This past Wednesday night, if you were here, we were watching a video and Joel Richardson was talking about some things that, he, that he's discovered. It was exciting. But at the end of that video, he, he, he got really excited and he, and he said, I want to tell everybody about this because our culture is so riddled with unbelief. Our society is just oozing with unbelief. It's just full of unbelief. If you look at our society, you can see a perfect example of what this verse says. When you have an unbelieving heart, it turns you away from God. And our society has turned away from God. We used to be a society that's foundation was on a belief in God. Now, even if they weren't Christians, even if they weren't saved, and a lot of our forefathers weren't, but a lot of our forefathers were, they still had a belief in biblical morality. They had a belief in God. They believed that what the Bible said was right was right. And what the Bible said was wrong was wrong. And even if they did it, they knew it was wrong. But we've turned away from belief. And we've, we've embraced as a society, as a culture, unbelief. Our universities, our schools are full of unbelief. Even our Bible colleges, even the seminaries. Tragic poll results that I read recently. 
about what people, what students who are entering Bible college, what students who are entering seminary believe, and most of them believe the Bible's true, and most of them believe in the virgin birth, and most of them believe in the resurrection, and most of them believe in the second coming, and years later as they're coming out of seminary, they don't believe the Bible's true, and they don't believe in the virgin birth, and they don't believe in the resurrection. They, they, they've been educated right out of that. Now, that's not all schools. There's some good schools. And there's some good seminaries, but there's an awful lot of them that are riddled with unbelief. But let's take to heart here what the word's saying to us and not point at the culture and say, look how bad they are. This verse was to brothers and sisters. Watch out that you don't allow an unbelieving heart to turn you away from the Lord. Belief is faith. And faith is belief. They're interchangeable. And also in the book of Hebrews, the Lord says, without it, you can't please me. That's Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, what does faith look like? Well, if you go to Hebrews 11, which we did in Sunday school today, you read a whole list of all these people who did things by faith, and it describes the things they did. Abel did this and Noah did this and Abraham did this and Isaac and Jacob and it goes down through through the hall of faith and all these people and you can look at what faith uh, enabled them to do what faith uh, made them capable of doing but that's really not looking at faith that's like looking at what faith does it's kind of like that example that Jesus used with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when he talked about the Holy Spirit isn't that kind of interesting He said, you can see what the wind does, but you can't see the wind. And you can see what faith does. That's why James says faith without works is dead. You can't, if you can't see what faith does, there's really not any faith there. You can see what faith does, but you can't see faith. So everybody look at the front of your bulletin because I put a picture of faith on the front of the bulletin right under that verse. It started out as a joke. Deanna and I were talking about what to put on the front of the bulletin. I said, so we're talking about what the sermon was going to be about. And I was like, well, what can we put on there that would be a picture of faith? And then I thought of that verse. Faith is being sure of what you don't see and certain, well, sure of what you believe and certain of what you do not see. And so I said, well, let's just leave a blank spot there and we'll call that a picture of faith. Faith is being sure, right? What's what's uh, Hebrews 11.1? 1? You got that one, Amanda? I tricked her up there. <laughs> Faith is confidence or sure of what we hope for and assurance or certainty about what we do not see. That's what faith is. That's believing. So that's this is what we're to have. Unbelief is what we're not to have. Be careful not to have an unbelieving heart. Everybody's got faith. Even people who say they're atheists, they've got faith. They've got faith in something. Everybody's got faith in something and everybody walks by their faith. Everybody walks by what they believe. Everybody lives their life by what they believe to be true. And our actions then show that. How have you ever been on an airplane? Rob and Mitzi are getting ready to climb on an airplane tomorrow and fly over the Pacific Ocean. But first you're going to fly up over the Arctic Ocean and then back down. That takes a lot of faith. Now, being an aerospace engineer, that probably helps you get And he says no. (laughs) 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 you got more stuff to overcome. But let me tell you, when you get to that place, you're in the little room, right? Then they're ready to take your boarding pass and you got to go on that tube to get in the smaller tube with wings on it. Once you step down that ramp, you're expressing faith you're saying i believe that this thing can fly if you didn't believe that you wouldn't get on it and once in a while there's probably somebody like deanna's parents who aren't going to fly to california who would get to that place of their boarding pass right and they would just about go and then they would say no i can't do it and they would turn away why would they turn away because they just can't believe that that thing's going to get them there safely and they're going to say no now, both of those, neither one of those things are sinful, but that's a good example of faith or unbelief. It's going to lead you in two different directions. 
In this case, for the Jews, it was causing them to turn away from faith in Christ, to turn back to what they, what they thought they knew was real because they'd grown up with it. Now for us, probably nobody in here, um, when, you, when you find an unbelieving heart or you're dealing, struggling with an unbelieving heart, turn away to a different religion. Maybe some of us, some of us might struggle with that, but that's, that's really not our struggle. But we turn away from God, and when we turn away from God, we turn to something else. What do we turn to? We turn to our coping mechanisms, our strategies to deal with our stresses, the things that we turn to other than God, some sort of distraction, something we do to, 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 to please ourselves or preserve ourselves or protect ourselves, or we're taken over by fear or despair. We, we begin to clasp onto those voices in our head that are uh, imaginations, pretensions, thoughts, and ideas that are setting themselves up against what we know to be true about God, but we just won't believe it at that moment. That voice that says, give up, quit, why persevere? God's not listening to you. He won't help you. But the ultimate, the ultimate end of that, if you go all the way down that road to it, the very end is just suicide. I might as well just quit life altogether. I might as well just kill myself. And that's, that's why people wind up to that spot. They've listened to those voices. In marriage, it's divorce, which is a suicide of a marriage. Pull the plug. Give up. I don't believe it can be fixed. I don't believe it can be healed. But to a lesser degree, it can be giving ourselves over to worry, over to fear, over to fretting, over to doubting, over to jealousy, over anger. You see, we all act in a manner that's consistent with what we really believe to be true. Now, I can say something's true. But do I really believe it? Well, my actions will show what I really believe. If I get on the plane or if I don't get on the plane. So what what precipitates an unbelieving heart in a believer? What would move us from belief to unbelief? Whether it's a, a subtle slight shift, a, a little move, or it's a big jump, all of a sudden, boom, unbelief. Well, for the Hebrew Christians, it was the persecution. It was hard hard circumstances it was painful circumstances and boy let me tell you that will begin to chip away at our belief it'll begin to chip away at our faith it'll begin to chip away at what god has said to be true and lead to doubt doubt is that little seed that the enemy plants in our minds something he can point to in our lives about those hard circumstances and whisper in our ear Did God really say? Same thing he said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, which is kind of interesting because in the Garden of Eden, their circumstances were perfect. It wasn't wasn't persecution. It wasn't hard. There wasn't anything hard about it. He provided every one of their needs. And still the devil said, Did God really say don't eat of that fruit? God knows when you eat of it, you'll become like him. And he's holding out on you. He's holding back something good from you. Your way is better. It was really the devil's way, but when we hear it in our mind, it becomes, my way is better. Did God really say? He wants to create in our hearts doubt. Doubt about God. That he's really good. That he really cares. That he's really all-powerful. That he's really paying attention. That he really hears you when you pray. Doubt about his promises. Doubt about what he said. Thought about doubt about his character. Maybe there's other ways. Maybe his way isn't the best way. Maybe he's not there at all. Maybe my way is better because it sure makes a whole lot more sense to me. Amen. Don't you don't you like telling God how your way is a lot better than his way? How your timing's a lot better than his timing? Doubt, according to the Bible, makes us unstable in all our ways. That's what James says. You got that one from James? Amanda, James 1? You're done. Okay. Let's open up our Bibles and let's turn to James 1. Hebrews, James. 
And you've read this before. And sometimes when, when you read it or other people read it, it made you just grit your teeth and say, I don't really want to hear this. Especially when it begins, this is beginning with James chapter 1, beginning with verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Same audience that the writer of Hebrews was writing to, brothers and sisters, so believers. Fellow believers. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, then you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, now this last from 6 and 7, that's 6, 7, and 8, is connected to 2, 3, 4, 5. So in this situation, when you're facing trials and you're being tested in your faith and you need perseverance, in that situation, when you ask the Lord, so what are we going to be asking the Lord? Lord, give me perseverance in this mess. Give me perseverance in this trial. Because I lack wisdom and I need wisdom. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Don't doubt that the Lord's going to give you wisdom. Why shouldn't we doubt that? Because the verse right above it just said he would. You must believe and not doubt. Now, here's the punchline. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Doubt makes us unstable in all we do. And it says a person who's in doubt is double-minded. What does that mean? It means some of the time I believe God, that's one mind, and some of the time I don't, that's the other mind. And we go back and forth. Well, well, I know God is, I'm not, no, maybe he won't. Oh, I'm just so worried. I'm just so concerned. Well, no, I know. No, maybe he won't. And we're unstable. We're back. We're like a, if that boat on the water. So you guys are in the Navy. You've been on those big ships on the big water. Man, they really go up and down and they roll. And, uh, Mike, Mike, Mike's got a good story. You should ask him about it sometime. Him and a buddy of him was on a big, big lake up in Canada when the storm came up. And they just about had the same, Jesus didn't come walking on the water, but it was a bad, if you've ever been in one of those places, when you think, I'm going to die, that's pretty much how this is going to end. He says, when you, when you get into that doubt, some of you have been there in your mind in the middle of the night, Amen. Up and down. That's the opposite of what the Bible talks about faith. Faith is, uh, faith is being sure. It's being certain. It's being confident. Those kinds of words aren't this. That's not this. Up and down like a wave of the sea, blown by the wind. It's this. It, that means I'm anchored. That's, that's the problem with being on a boat. It's not tied to anything. And it just moves where the water moves. You gotta, you gotta have an anchor. Being sure, being certain. Like a tree who's planted by rivers of living water and the roots go down deep. Right? That's what we need. A house built on a foundation of stone, a foundation of rock. Though the waves crash against the house and the wind blows and the rain beats down, it will not fall. Holds fast. Peter, when he, when he got out of the boat, he was walking on the water by faith. There was something solid underneath him. And what was solid is that thing that's on the front of your bulletin. That picture right there, that's what he was walking on. Faith. But when he took his eyes off Christ, all of a sudden he didn't have anything solid to stand on it anymore. Our faith is what anchors us. Makes us unshakable, unflappable unstoppable makes us have words on our mouth like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego oh king our God is able to save us from the fiery furnace but even if he doesn't we're still not going to do the wrong thing that's being anchored Daniel did you know that there was an edict that says you can't pray three times? I know that's true, but I'm still going to I'm going to obey God even if though you throw me in the den of lions. My God is able to 
to preserve me. And King Darius got up the next morning and rolled the stone away. Daniel, was your God able to preserve you? Yes. He came and he shut sent an angel and shut the lion's mouth. Just this week, I read a story about a, a man in Nigeria, Africa. Nigeria, we need to pray for Nigeria. As the Lord lays that on your heart, it's a split country. The north is Islamic, the south is Christian. And every day, the raiders come down and kill Christians and steal their children. Boko Haram is the name of the group. That's the Al-Qaeda of Nigeria. They came into the village and they pulled the men out and they said, Do you believe in Christ? Are you a Christian? And the man said yes and they shot him and took his wife and his kids. So what do you think the next guy had a choice now? You gotta be anchored. You gotta be anchored. You gotta have faith in something that's beyond yourself. You gotta have faith in, in, in the world to come. You gotta know that you know that you know, right? When you get the cancer diagnosis. When we don't know what's gonna happen with our daughter. We can't get our hands on it. We can't fix it. We have to have faith that makes us unshakable in God and his word, in the resurrection and in the life to come. That Jesus is going to come and he is going to set all things straight and he is going to avenge all wrongdoing and he's going to punish the wickedness and he's going to establish his kingdom and he's going to reign forever. And that settles it. We need an attitude of, uh, of since this is true, then this is how I'm going to live. Listen to what David wrote in Psalms 46. And, and maybe think about some of the circumstances that are making you do this number. You know, making you do be the double minus. Here's what David wrote. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help. Present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way. You want to talk about... <laughs> Not having anything... He says that even though the, the earth gives away, though the mountains crumble and fall into the sea, though the sea roars and foams, not going to be afraid. Why? Because the next verse says, because there is a city, and you know who lives in that city? That city that's not subject to all the junk that, we're, that we have down here? God lives in that city. God dwells in that city. And because God is there and God is on the throne, it doesn't matter what happens on this earth because my trust is there, my hope is there, my faith is there, my citizenship is there. And that's where Jesus is coming back from. And because that's true, my anchor holds within the veil. The Holy of Holies... Uh, that was in the temple of Jerusalem is not there. It hasn't been there since AD 70. But I want to tell you, there's a temple in heaven. Hebrews says so. It says there's a temple in heaven. This one on earth was just a copy of the heaven one. And that's the one, the one in heaven, is where Jesus took his blood after the crucifixion and made atonement for our sins. And my hanker holds within that veil. And there's a chain from that anchor all the way to us right here on earth, wherever you are, whatever you're facing, whatever circumstance you're going through. <laughs> You need to latch on to that and hold on to that. And that's the battle of belief or unbelief. Unbelief makes us unstable in all our ways. And when we become unstable, we become vulnerable. Everybody see a, anybody see a boxing match in your life? Two. How, anybody see the movie Rocky in your life? Okay, more. In a boxing match, these guys, the guys come out, the bell rings, and they begin to spar, okay? And the, and the guy's just kind of kind of dancing around. You know, he's just kind of feeling the guy out, throw a jab every now and then, jab, 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 just kind of testing. But then all of a sudden, he lands a blow. Boom! And the guy's knees buckle just a little bit. His knees buckle. All right? And the whole crowd goes, oh! And the, the guy who's on the, the microphone calling it on TV says, oh, he's hurt. And what happens with the other guy? When, when that guy's knees buckle and there's just this little 
indication that he's in trouble, man, that other guy, he just pours it on. He just begins to, to begin to pummel that guy at a, at a furious pace, at a pace that he, there's no way he could keep that pace up through the fight, through the whole fight. But he knows that guy's, that guy's buckled just a little bit. And man, he pours it on before you know it, that guy's out. That's exactly how the devil fights. Let me see a little throw of doubt here. Let's throw some doubt over here. Just, just pick around the edges. The thing about the devil is he's got like 20 arms. <laughs> and just when you think he's not, he comes around and hits you in the back of the head. Something you weren't expecting. No, oh, boom. See if he can get you to just, just doubt just a little bit. And as soon as he can get your knees to buckle, man, he pours it on. He begins to pound you. He can get a little wobble, a little instability. Doubt makes us unstable in all our ways. He pours it on. He'll throw in some criticism from your family or from your friends. He'll throw in a, a, a just a little something from somebody you thought you trusted is going to betray you. He'll throw in somebody who you thought was walking with the Lord and they fall into terrible sin. And, and he'll throw in the world, world and the society and he'll just pour it on because he, he's, he knows your knees have buckled just a little bit. Maybe God, Maybe God's word isn't true. <coughs> Paul says at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. What's the next line? I have kept the faith. That's what the fight is. The fight with unbelief. And unbelief begins with a, a jab of doubt. And if he can get a little jab of doubt in there, you know what he's got? He's got a left hook of anxiety and an uppercut of fear. Anxiety and fear come right in after doubt. He's like a predator, like a lion, the Bible says, seeking whom he may devour. And this is how he does it. The greater our faith, if you can put, put faith on a graph, on the line going up, you can put another line going like this. The greater our faith, the less fear, doubt, fear and anxiety we'll have. The, the, the lower our faith, the more fear and anxiety we'll have. They're just proportionally opposites. And God will give you what you need to believe. He'll give you enough evidence to believe. He'll give you a word. Even if he does nothing new, he's already given us enough to believe that he loves us, amen? And that he'll never leave us and forsake it. He proved it right here. Even if he never does us enough, but we, but we have to believe it. He'll give us enough to believe but he'll never give us enough that we don't have to put our faith or to utilize our faith because without faith it's impossible to believe God. He's just set it up that way. And he talks a lot about confidence, having confidence, not letting go of our confidence, not throwing away our confidence, having confidence to approach. We'll talk about that more next week. And as we go through this series, I hope we're going to see that pretty much everything we struggle with Almost always, if you boil it down to the very bottom, to the root cause, you're going to come up with unbelief. Our sin struggles. Because we don't really, truly, 100% believe God, and so we turn to something else. We turn away to something else that will comfort us. Our attitude struggles. Our anger struggles. Our relational struggles. Because we don't believe. And because we don't believe, we don't submit worry, fear, anxiety. It comes down to trusting, believing, anchoring, holding on to the truth. And it's, this, this is the way we hold on. This is the way we anchor. Okay, We get a lot of truth in us. It's the only weapon that we have, but it's good enough. It defeats a lie every time. we got to get the truth in us. we got to remind each other of the truth. Did you know that's a part of our job? To remind each other of the truth? And that when one of us is struggling... Somebody else builds them up. You know how we do that? We did some of it today. You did some of it today. This is what the Lord has done for me. This is how the Lord took care of me. This is how the Lord healed me. This is what the Lord's doing in my life right now. And as we do that, we build each other up in our faith. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns you away from the living God.